Last week I put together a water cooled Raspberry Pi 4 and overclocked it to 2 GHz to see how well the cooling system works. It was really effective and I only saw a couple of degrees increase in temperature when running at full CPU load for 5 minutes. This sounds great but the water cooling system used on the Pi costs a couple of times more than the Pi does and uses more power than the Pi too. So we need to have a look at whether some of the other options are more cost effective and how well they work to keep the Pi cool. So in this video I'm going to be comparing the temperature and having a look at the cost of four different cooling options. We'll be looking at just putting aluminium heat sinks onto the Pi, then using the heat sinks in conjunction with a fan on a compact case, then a more significant fan and heat sink combination called an ice tower, and then lastly the water cooling system. For each cooling option I'll start by running the CPU at full load at the default clock frequency of 1.5 GHz, and we'll then do a second test with the overclock power to 2 GHz. I'll record the CPU temperature at 1 second intervals and plot these onto a graph for each. The Raspberry Pi 4 allows the CPU temperature to go up to 80 degrees Celsius before it starts throttling the CPU performance, to lower the temperature and prevent the CPU from burning out. So if any of the cooling options exceed 80 degrees, then you're going to start getting limited performance from the Pi, and you'll probably reduce its life by running it hot for extended periods of time. Let's start out with the plain aluminium heat sinks. This is by far the cheapest option. You can usually get a set of these for around $1 to $2. They have a peel-off back and you just stick them onto the heat generating components on the Pi. The benefit of the heatsink only option is that it's completely silent, so if you've got a low intensity application for your Pi then this might be a good option. Let's see how well they do in the thermal tests. We'll start off at 1.5 GHz. Right off the mark, before even starting the test, the Pi is already running quite warm. We've got a starting temperature of around 51 degrees. It took around a minute and 40 seconds before the CPU was at 80 degrees, and the performance started getting throttled. There isn't much point in continuing the test once we've hit 80 degrees, as we're then losing CPU performance and the temperature will just stay at around 80 degrees as the Pi manages the CPU load. I then stopped the test and you can see that the temperature initially dropped off quite quickly, but flattened out after another minute or so, at around 65 degrees, so it would take a long time to get back down to the 50 degrees starting temperature. Next I increased the clock frequency to 2 GHz. Running at 2 GHz, we had a starting temperature of around 61 degrees at idle, which is already pretty high, and it only took about 10 seconds to reach 80 degrees once the test was started. You can also clearly see the power throttling the CPU performance on this graph. The cooldown curve after the test is quite similar to the 1.5 GHz test, flattening out at a slightly higher temperature than at the start of the test. You can see how much faster the 2 GHz test increased the CPU temperature. It's basically unusable without any active cooling. Now let's move on to the acrylic case. I typically enjoy making my own cases for Raspberry Pis, but I did have this one from an earlier Pi lying around, so I just opened up the cutouts for the HDMI ports on the side to make it fit. The fan and CPU are in the same place, so the fan is blowing directly down onto the CPU heatsink. These acrylic cases with fans are also quite a cheap option, and usually range between $5 and $10 for the case, including the fan and the heatsinks. These small fans are quite noisy though, so it can be distracting if you're just using your Pi as a desktop computer, or you use it as a media player on your TV. Let's see how effective the fan is at keeping the CPU cool. The fan has already helped reduce the starting temperature to a low of 46 degrees. I was then able to run the test for a full 3.5 minutes without the power overheating. The temperature seems to stabilize around 65 degrees. The temperature also drops off much faster now once the test is stopped. So you can comfortably use your Pi at any CPU load in a fan case at 1.5 GHz. Now let's try overclocking it to 2 GHz and see if the temperature still stays under 80 degrees. The idle temperature at 2 GHz increased a little to 50 degrees, and unfortunately we weren't able to complete the test at 2 GHz. The Pi overheated a little over a minute into the test and started throttling the CPU performance. There was still a sharp drop in temperature once the test stopped. So the case fan helps quite a bit, but it's not an effective option if you're going to be overclocking your Pi. Here's a comparison between the two tests with the fan case. Now let's have a look at the ice tower. This has become a popular option for cooling Pi's, and they make a low profile version now too. They're also quite affordable, costing just $20 to $25. The ice tower has a much bigger heatsink, with heat pipes to a large radiator, 
with a significantly larger fan than the case. The ice tower is also quite noisy. It's about the same sound level as a case fan, so let's see if it does a better job in the thermal test. Our starting temperature is now lower than with the case, at just 41 degrees. I was also able to run the test for the full 3 minutes and it only went slightly over 50 degrees. This is more than a 10 degree difference over the fan case. You can also see that the temperature returns to almost the same as the idle temperature just 20 seconds after the test is stopped, which is the quickest so far. The ice tower is looking promising for overclocking, so let's take it up to 2 GHz. There wasn't much difference between the idle temperature at 1.5 and 2 GHz. At 2 GHz we started again at around 41 degrees. The ice tower managed the full run of 3 minutes without going much over 60 degrees, but it looked like it was still steadily increasing. So I left it running for a further 2 minutes to see how it went, and it started flattening out at about 65 degrees. So an ice tower is a great option for cooling your power, even when overclocked. It is quite a lot more expensive than the previous two options, and you'll still need to get a case and cover for your power, but there are a few options available, with a cutout specifically for the ice tower. Now let's have a look at the final option, the water cooling system which I built for mine. This setup is by far the largest and most expensive. The cooling system cost around $100 for all the parts to assemble it, and this was using a cheap non-name brand kit, which is definitely not the best quality. One benefit of this setup is that it's much quieter than the fan case or ice tower, as the larger 120mm fan turns much slower. Let's see how the water cooled setup does in the thermal test. Starting with the 1.5 GHz test, the idle temperature is now just 28 degrees, which is over 10 degrees lower than the ice tower and 20 degrees lower than the heatsink option. There was a noticeable spike in temperature when the test started, but it remains fairly constant at 32 degrees for the 3.5 minutes of the test. It also dropped back down to the starting temperature almost instantly when the test was stopped. Now let's try overclocking it to 2 GHz. At 2 GHz we have the same starting temperature of around 28 degrees. We again have a noticeable spike when starting the test, but the temperature stays around 38 degrees for the remainder of the test. I ran this test for 4 minutes before stopping it, and the temperature dropped off almost instantly again when it stopped. So the water cooling system definitely works the best at keeping the power cool and providing a much quieter cooling solution, but is way more expensive than the other options and is more difficult to assemble as well. It's also not exactly compact, the system is a couple of times larger than the ice tower and that's already considered to be a large heatsink for the power. Here's an overlay of all of the cooling options I've tested today. It's quite noticeable just how much better the ice tower and water cooling circuits are for high CPU loads, especially when overclocked. Heatsinks only and fan cases are great if you're going to be using your power for light loads, such as a power hole, network storage or a Wi-Fi camera. If you're going to be doing any CPU intensive tasks, like video editing, light gaming or simulations, then you'll need to get a more substantial cooling solution, like the ice tower. And if you're a fan of overkill like me, then you'll definitely need a water cooled power. Let me know in the comments section what you use to cool your power. Thanks for watching. Please remember to like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe for more tech and electronics projects, tutorials and reviews.